Hey folks, it's Joe. Like many of you, I suspect, I'm pretty devastated by the loss of Tom Petty. So as a tribute to Tom, we're going to replay our episode with Steve Ferroni, the drummer for the Heartbreakers. But first I wanted to share some stories about how Tom and the band have influenced my life. I was born in 1980, and as a result, I can't remember a time when I wasn't aware of the music of Tom Petty. When Full Moon Fever came out, I remember seeing it on CD format at my friend Dan's house. His father had recently purchased it, and it was still in the long CD box that they used to have so that the CDs would fit into record bins. One of my early cassette single purchases was Into the Great Wide Open, and of course, I still remember every frame of the video which starred Johnny Depp. When I was 14, I was fully immersed in punk rock and had little but disdain for any sort of mainstream music or anything on a major label for that matter. But I had to make an exception for Wildflowers, which is a perfect record. And the first collaboration between our guest today, Steve Ferroni and Tom Petty. One of the greatest concerts I've ever seen happened in 2010, shortly after my dad got sick. I was in a terrible place in my life. I was under a lot of stress. And almost on a whim, I splurged and bought really great tickets to go see Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers play at Marcus Amphitheater in Milwaukee. I was blown away at the incredible tightness of the band and how they achieved the perfect balance between polished professionalism and sloppy rock and roll. The most striking thing to me was the fact that their set comprised over two hours of nothing but hits. It was astounding. So when I had a chance to interview Steve Ferroni for this show, I was ecstatic. Lots of people live by the philosophy that you should never meet your heroes because it will always let you down. But when I met Steve, he couldn't have been cooler or more generous or more gracious. He and I both smoked Cuban cigars throughout the interview, and afterwards he was nice enough to mail me a book that meant a lot to him. And as if that wasn't enough, Steve was kind enough to invite me to see the band perform in San Diego just a couple weeks ago. Getting to see that band from the side of the stage felt like a dream. It still doesn't feel like it was real. But again, the band blew me away. The band played American Girl for their encore. And within seconds of leaving stage, each band member got into his own Escalade and was ferried off into the night. Except for Tom, who jumped into his tour bus. I'll never forget the image of him coming off stage with a giant smile and a cigarette hanging from his mouth in his fringed out leather jacket that only he could pull off jumping on the bus and disappearing. Rest in peace, Tom, you rock and roll genius. And nothing but love and respect for Steve Ferroni and the rest of the Heartbreakers. This is Joe Wong. Welcome to The Trap Set, where each week we explore the lives of drummers. I want to play something for you. You're hearing You Wreck Me by Tom Petty, featuring my guest, Steve Ferroni on drums. As a child, Steve trained as a tap dancer, but by the time he was 12 years old, he was playing gigs behind the drums. Steve's first big break came when he joined the Average White Band, which eventually led to sessions with Shaka Khan, Al Jarreau, Duran Duran, Eric Clapton, Michael Jackson, and more. Steve's sense of song is second to none, 
and his groove is so strong that he can propel classic songs without playing fills or even touching the crash cymbal. For the past 25 years, Steve has been the drummer for Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. As a member of one of the all-time great rock bands, he's successfully honored the legacy left by his predecessor Stan Lynch, while also helping the Heartbreakers explore new creative terrain. I spoke to Steve in his backyard in Southern California. I'm not a smoker, but I couldn't turn down his offer to try a Cuban cigar. And now our conversation with Steve Ferroni. Uh, my father wasn't around, but he was a he was a, a dancer for uh, um, for the for the Sierra Leone National Dance uh, uh, Company, and my mother my mother w- was a factory worker. Uh, my grandmother was a stay at home grandma, and my grandfather was a milkman. So everybody lived in one house. Yes. Which town were you in? Brighton. Brighton, nice. Yeah. In the south coast of England. So as a kid, you had your grandfather to look to as a mentor. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> so your father wasn't around, and then the milkman, grandfather. Yeah, my, 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 no, my grand, no, my grandfather was not. It was, it, was, it, was, uh, it was like, he was, it was, it was like very miserable. He wasn't a very happy man. Yeah, so was. were you a happy kid? Oh, I was a happy kid, all right. Yeah, very happy kid. And, uh, but my, my grandfather was... Um, he was a milkman. You know, he'd get up at three o'clock in the morning, he'd do his milk round, and then he'd uh, stop off in the pub on the way back home and have a pint, and then come back home to his wife and probably argue with her, go to bed, get woken up by school kids going home at four o'clock in the afternoon, and be <laughs> really pissed off that, that, that children actually played on the street. <laughs> my grandfather was my grandfather was an untreated alcoholic. <laughs> right. My my grandfather used to work in the brewery and uh, down the street and he, he would get regularly drunk for free in the brewery and then he'd just come right at the end of the street and he'd sort of stagger home and one day he came back home and he got into an altercation with my grandmother and he decided that he would uh, w- what would work for him would be to, to reach out and sh- show her his hand you know and my grandmother sent my mother up the street to go and get my uncle Ted who was a boxing champion and uh, a local boxing champion and uh, Uncle Ted came down and beat him up so badly that he became a milkman. So <laughs> he changed beverages. <laughs> yeah, changed beverages. Well, he didn't change beverages. He just changed drinking so much of it and decided not to work at the brewery anymore. It, was, uh, it made it a little bit more difficult to get as much to drink as he wanted. But he was, as a result of that, he was a very unhappy man. How did you find music? When I was three... Uh, I, I was a, when I was a little kid, I used to sit in the high chair and I would beat my spoon. We had a radio, no TV, it was a radio. And I'd sit there and listen to music and I'd beat my spoon in time with that. And so my uh, my, my, my grandmother and my mother uh, decided that, you know, they had to do something with, with me because I seemed to be affected by rhythms a lot. And uh, and they, they took me to uh, a tap dancing school. And, uh, and there I learned to tap dance. And, uh, and I became pretty good at that. And uh, as I got older, um, you know, I mean, there were no other black black children in my in my uh, in my town. I was it. Uh, and um, um, as I got older, my my parents started. There was a a, a, a theatre that did uh, music hall, so yeah, and uh, you know, act number one, act number two. And there was a, 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 a close harmony group called the Deep River Boys that used to come uh, uh, from uh, from New York, and they, they had a radio station, a radio radio show on Radio Luxembourg. And uh, they used to, I guess, they used to do a lot of stuff for the armed forces, and uh, and um, and they they performed at this uh, at this uh, theater, and my parents took me down there, and I loved the music. I just loved the music, yeah, you know? and. Um, they sing, sing songs like Lucky Black Cat, Lucky Black Cat, na, 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 all that sort of stuff, like close harmony. So th- so I, 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 I started jumping around in the audience, and I did that, that music, I loved that. And then they, they, they saw me out there, so they invited me back. And uh, uh, and at that point, it really hadn't registered, color hadn't registered with me at all. I mean, it didn't, I was just another kid, you know. And uh, I saw these, these uh, 
these 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 five black men on the stage and uh, singing and dancing and I was like man I'd like to I, that's I'd like to be that you know and uh, and so I went back and I said to this the, the Harry Douglas who was the leader of the band I said to him I said you know I really wish I could be black like you and he was a very wise man you know uh, actually I didn't say black I said colored because colored was the uh, acceptable term at that point and uh, and uh, Harry Douglas and his all his wisdom he said you know what I'm going to do I'm going to cast a spell and when you wake up in the morning I want you to go look in the mirror and you'll see <laughs> that you'll be black like uh, well colored like we uh, we are you know and um great terrific so I couldn't wait to go to bed that night went to bed and I woke up ran downstairs looked in the mirror and yes it worked and that was kind of all I thought about it that was it you know? <laughs> 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 so that was how I became a black guy <laughs> so when, when were you born 50 1950 yeah as you got into drumming mm. and and noticed that lots of the iconic drummers up until then were black did that register with you in any way uh, well i didn't it, it you know it, 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 you know i think the thing is is that you know race really didn't figure too much you know my mom's what like the whitest person on the planet i met my father once when i was nine years old and he was like the blackest person i ever saw so race it really didn't didn't figure into it for me i mean the first drummers that i saw were, were was uh beatles uh, ringo and uh, and uh, and charlie watts that was the the first ones that i saw and then I started uh, I, when I when I was twelve, and started playing in bands. The, the older guys took me down to see uh, uh, to see the blues, the blues uh, 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 group, uh, all these blues uh, artists that came through: Muddy Waters, Sonny Terry, Brownie McGee, uh, 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 John Lee Hooker. All these guys. They they had, you know Bill Doggett. They always to come through on these tours, and uh, and they had a blues tour, and they would come through and do that. And this, of course, was at a time when people in Britain appreciated those artists more than the oh, Americans absolutely. did. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, how did you start playing? Well, I was, uh, I was in this, uh, I'd, I'd sort of graduated from being a, um, uh, 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 a kid in a dance school. I went to, my, my parents took me to an audition and, uh, and I got a job in a summer show uh, as a as in a children's chorus, so we'd sing and dance, and um, we had to finish work. I think we, we we there was two shows a night, and we had to finish work like halfway through. I think like ten o'clock at night was we had to all go home, go go you know go to sleep and the uh, uh, union rules and stuff. You know. But uh, we we used to do this uh, 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 this song. It was uh, it was it was like we'd go and do the twist, you know. Right. And. Uh, and we'd sing a song with the star of the show, this guy Max Bygraves. And I looked. I used to look down into the orchestra pit, and I'd, I'd see the, uh, I see the drummer. And I'm like, oh, that's how they do. So then I tried to do it, and of course, motor skills weren't that good. So then I started practicing my motor skills, and to, so I could do that with a knife and fork. And so you taught yourself. Yeah. And then I added feet. <laughs> <laughs> well you already had the feet from dancing right yeah but just to like trying to figure out what the how the drums sounded you know what the, what, what what that would actually mean to the to the drums you know that would sort of kick over to the drums when did you start playing professionally i left school at 15 because the, they you know i i i had i i'd started playing in bands at 13 and uh and i knew i wanted to be a I, that's what i wanted to do when i left school did it uh, seem like something that was possible at the time? I thought it was possible. Everybody, all the teachers and everything thought I was crazy. And some of my school friends thought I was crazy too. <laughs> um, uh, uh, they told me it wasn't a real job. So I guess I've been out of work for the past uh, 60 years. I guess you <laughs> win. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I, um, uh, uh, they, I, you know, I, uh, when I said uh, careers class, this guy, uh, his name we used to call him Fatty Kenwick. I was the, the careers master, and he said, well, we'll "Go around the class. What do you want to do when you leave school?" You know, and I said, "You know, I want to be a I want to be a drummer." And he said, "You can't do that. That's not a real job." And I said, "Well, Ringo Starr does it." He said, "Well, that's Ringo Starr. You can't do that." And I said, "Well, I can play like him." You know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, and so they started to mock me. They started to call me Ringo. And when did you know that you could do it? 
Well, I was playing at 12. I was playing in bands. We, my band used to open for The Who. I used to play in this little club on the, on the beach. And uh, 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 the, When you were 12? Yeah. And what were your interactions with Keith like when you were 12? He's, you know, he was, he was really cool. He was this crazy guy. Uh, I was playing with guys that were like 18 years old. They were all much older than me. And, uh, and um, uh, um, yeah, but, you know, he, he, he had this really, he used to have a really beautiful Ludwig kit that was really cool, but it kept getting stolen. And, and then Premier gave him a kit, and that was when they started to smash up stuff, when they started to get given stuff. People would give it to them, and then they'd smash it up, and then, and then they'd love it, so they'd give them more stuff. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, uh, so I had an Olympic kit, which was a, 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 a an intermediate uh, premier kit called called, uh, called Olympic. The entry level kit was called a Gigster, which was really shit. It was a, it was a shit drum kit. <laughs> I left school and I got a job in a factory, and uh, and I started to look in the uh, uh, ad, look at ads in the New Musical Express. I'm playing locally. I started. Uh, I played with a local band that was uh, an organ trio band, who that kind of introduced me to Jimmy Smith and Grady Tate. Mm -hmm. um, um, and uh, and that sort of that, that sort of led to uh, the CTI music catalog was a little bit which was. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, it, it's funny. Like now, in retrospect, when I think about it, is like the, uh, the 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 actual sound of those records was uh, was 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 really important. I I never really thought about that at the time. That it was just the, more the songs I would listen to, but uh, uh, w now when I listen to them, I'm like, man, the sound of that thing. It sounds really, sounds really good. You know, and just uh, um, some actually, I think Tom. Petty actually got that before I did because he always talk about like we're making that sound. I, 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 my thing was more like we're playing those songs. Right. You know, we were getting to play that song. We're getting through this song. Uh, so he's very much uh, aware of sounds. Uh, uh, I mean, I guess tone, <coughs> tone sort of came into it for me, but less so than than the, than, than the actual song itself. Yeah. What was your life like at the time? I mean, were you still living at home? I lived at home. I lived at home for a while, and um, and then uh, uh, I, I went from like you know working building site as a I worked in a site office as a storekeeper in a site office to I would start off in, in it, working in a factory and I hated that and then I went to the building site which let me get outside a lot more and I liked that better and then I became a paint sprayer and uh, and. Uh, I went and do these. I went and did these little trips. I used to go do little trips to, uh, to uh, to France, to go and go and play for the, uh, to go and play for the Americans, American on the bases, yeah. And that was when I first sort of found Purdy, and uh, um, and uh, uh, my mother got really upset when I left her. <laughs> she was really when the first time I left home, she was like in tears, just like broke down crying. And then I left and got away, and then I forgot something. I had to go back and get it, and she just got really upset again. <laughs> That's pretty anticlimactic. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but um, and then I st I got back and I, uh, I went back home, and I was still living at home, and uh, and uh, started to answer, make some calls up to London, uh, uh, and uh, these guys wanted me to go up and sort of play with them, and I went up there, and I did the starving musician thing. Uh, uh, the guy that I worked for was a paint was working as a paint sprayer, and uh, he was the guy that was in the SAS in the war. And he said, "Listen, you know, when I told him, I said, I've been, these guys asked me to go out and play some music, and he said, do you love music?' And I said, "Yeah." He said, "You know, you can come down here and paint spray any time. You know, well, just give it a shot, see what you're going to do. You only live once. You know, you've been through a lot of stuff in the war, and uh, and uh, so I went up to London, and I started to work with these guys in London." My first, uh, my first black experience was working with black musicians, uh, and uh, um, Calvin Bullen, 
and Hugh Bullen. Hugh passed away uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, but uh, uh, um, we used to go down to the Q Club and hang out in the Q Club, you know, in the, uh, which is a black club in London. And it was funny because I was raised in Brighton. You know, you walk up to a young lady and say, would you like to dance? You know, and you'd either get, oh yeah, and they dance with you, or you get rejected, one or the other. You go into, you go into, I walk into the Q Club and these guys, there's these girls like, was sort of sitting around, sitting around the edge of, you know, beautiful black, black women were sitting there and these guys would sort of walk up to them and go, <laughs> so much cooler. <laughs> and I, and you know, if you did that to a girl in Brighton, it was on. She beat the shit out of you. you know. <laughs> uh, they snap their fingers, and these girls would get up and dance with them. You know. Like, so how long before you tried that? I tried it once, and I got away with it once. But then I didn't want to try it again. It didn't feel right to do it. it wasn't raised that way. My mother would have killed me if she had seen me do that. <laughs> 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 I think you should try it the next time they lead a bunch of girls backstage at a petty concert. <laughs> we don't have a bunch of girls. We're too old to a bunch of girls. But any bunch of girls is usually somebody's daughter. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't stop some guys, right? Yeah, some of them it doesn't. No, no, no. We're a pretty conservative band when it comes to that. You know, so. <laughs> so you did the starving musician thing in yeah. London. Yeah. And and you said it was like your first black musical experience. Yeah. Were you more conscious of your race identity at the time, or not really? Well, I can tell you what what did it was the uh, was uh, food. Uh, being a starving musician, uh, uh, you know, I was really starving. I didn't have anything to eat, and uh, <laughs> and and. Um, uh, uh, these guys that I was hanging, they, they'd meet these girls from Jamaica, and they'd say, they'd say, okay, listen, she's going to cook for us, you know, we're going to she's gonna cook some food. Let's go over to this girl's house. So we go over this this girl's house, and she'd make like curry goat and rice and beans, which was definitely not in my vocabulary of eating, you know. But I was starving, so I I developed a taste for it, you know. I developed I developed this uh, this taste, and I really 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 enjoy. Uh, that that food now you know curries and stuff I went, to, I went to india and i had a ball in india oh yeah I, I go down to the islands and i usually grab the guys that work in the hotels and it's like where can i get some real food you know <laughs> <laughs> right yeah, but um uh yeah i mean uh yeah i learn a lot about other other cultures you know uh, develop other different other, other tastes what were your aspirations at the time? Did you want to be a rock star? Did you want to be a session player? What were you thinking? I just wanted to play music. I just, I mean, I, I never really sort of, you know, had a plan. I, I just, I just, I just enjoyed playing. I want to play with as many people, all the people that I'd heard that heard about that I liked and that I wanted to play with, you know, and uh, and um, uh, um, befriend them and uh, and and and. Uh, get to know them uh, I mean I, I got a, I got I, I learned so much uh, from uh, when I started with Average White Band playing with Average White Band and then I went we went to New York and cut cut the cake in New York and uh, and um, and Arif Martin because I'd write I'd jot down when something would work I'd jot it down so I could remember what it was and uh, and um and uh, Arif noticed that I, that, I, that I read music, and he asked me, he said, listen, he said, uh, you want to do some sessions for me, you know? Mm. Now, Arif is the guy that produced lots of those early Purdy records that he did with yes. Aretha. Yes, exactly. So now Him it's kind Wexler. of come full circle. Yeah. So now I'm actually in this, in this, uh, in this arena with this guy, you know? and, uh, and uh, he started to hire me uh, to play on, uh, on records, um, I think uh, one of the first ones that we cut was uh, it was called Woman in a Man's World and that was Bette Midler and uh, 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 and then we cut uh, um, I'm Every Woman with Chaka Khan which was a huge record yeah and then uh, uh, it, it sort of you know I did that album that whole album and, it, and then 
And then I started to do, I started to use my other one, George Benson. This, and then uh, the other producers started saying, he's using this guy Ferroni. You know, let's just uh, let's use Ferroni and do that. What is it about you that people gravitated towards? Was it the playing or was it the way that you worked in the studio? I played on a lot of hit records. A lot of hit records, a lot of big hit records. And, uh, and, and I don't know whether they were hit records <laughs> because they were hit records. I mean, there was a couple that, uh, Ordinary World. When I heard that, I said, you don't really need me on here. This, you know, this could sell itself. You know, they said, oh, we want you to play on it. Uh, or whether I've actually brought something to it. Uh, um, I, I think uh, maybe at most <laughs> I didn't mess up people's songs. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I didn't screw up people's songs, and and uh, they got they got what they wanted. Now, I, I mean, I always sort of my my the way that I approach the drums. You know, I, I, I said this before. It's, it's kind of like a service service that you do, right? Is that I I try and find out what it is that you want, and once I found out what you want, then I try to own it. This episode of The Trap Set is brought to you in part by Colectivo Coffee, handmade coffee since 1993. Check them out online at colectivo.com. So you're in New York and you're, you're part of this crew of studio drummers that includes your heroes like Purdy and mm. then guys like Gad were right. around at the Chris time. Chris Barker. Yeah, and um, Rick Morota and Murata, people yeah. like that. Yeah. Did you think, hey, this is fine? Maybe my life is just this from here on out, or or did you move? Uh, to no, another well, phase? I mean, w what happened was this: average white band finished. Yeah, and, and so I just sort of drifted into being in more of a studio. I mean, I've been working s sessions in the in the studio. Uh, actually, you know, one of the guys in the band said, well, you know, why are you doing all these sessions? Why are you doing? Why are you playing sessions? You know." And I said, because I like to play. I don't want to sit around and not do, not play when I'm when we're not on the road. It's the average white man, you know. And uh, and um, did you need the money? No, not at all. Not then. I didn't need it. But then, when average white man stopped, that sort of became my source of uh, my source of income, you know. And uh, and so, I did that. And then I got uh, asked to play in the Saturday Night Live band. And I became house drummer for Saturday Night Live band. And then. Uh, John Taylor asked me to go and do some stuff with Duran Duran in uh, in London. So I went to London and started recording with Duran. We recorded Notorious. And then uh, 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 we went to uh, Bob Geldof's knighthood, knighthood party. And uh, Phil Collins comes walking up to me. He said, hey, Steve, how are you doing? Because I'd met him a couple of times before. And he said, uh, do you ever meet Eric Clapton? And I said, I met him once with Average White Band. He sort of came down to one of our shows. I met him briefly, but you know, and he said, "Oh, he said, come over and come over and meet him." So he, he takes me over and we sit down at this table with Eric Clapton and Phil, and we sit there and we talk for a bit and chit chat. And then I said, "Well, I got to go over and join my guys. It's nice to meet you." And I left. And then a week later, I got a phone call. Said, uh, "Eric, Eric wants you to come play a gig with him. You want to do that?" And he hadn't done anything in a long time. And so uh, I I got asked to go and uh, go and go and play a couple of gigs in a, a couple of clubs, one in London, one in New York, you know. And I thought, well, that'd be fun to go and do play with Clapton. And then, and then I started to get calls about going on tour. This is like mid '80s. Uh, yeah, yeah, around that, yeah, yeah, because yeah, '85 when I started with uh, with Duran. What was going on in your personal life at the time? Like, did you ever get married or have children? Oh, or anything? I've been married and divorced. Uh, uh, actually, I got married. In, I got married. The last time I got married was in '85. Uh, 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 I, married, I married an English girl, a very good friend of mine. Uh, now she's still a good friend of yours. She's still a good friend. All right. She was. I mean, I met her. She was just like she was like dynamite, uh, amazing, amazing looking girl. And um, uh, uh, Jackie, 
Jackie, Jackie, Jacqueline Keeley, if she hears this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, we we got married, but you know, I you know I, I, I back in those days uh, I had my issues with alcohol and drugs and uh, and uh, so. So what were your favorite drugs? Oh, cocaine and cocaine and cocaine and any and I drink anything. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a strong constitution? Very strong. Fortunately. So you could go all night. Yeah. People used to say... And you were in Duran Duran, and you were playing with Clapton. Yeah. So that stuff was readily available. Well, yeah, but I didn't... I, I, I didn't... Uh, the only thing was, was that, I, I mean, uh, when average white man, I tried doing that while I was playing, and it would get in the way of my playing. So I didn't really like that too much. So what I would do was I would... I would um, I would wait until after the show had finished, and then I would be out all night doing, hanging out, doing. Go home, go to bed about four, five o'clock in the morning, six o'clock. Get up, go to the gym, sweat it out, <laughs> sweat it out, and sweat it out in the gym, and start all over again. You know. Uh, uh, so. Uh, so did the drugs get like really out of control, where you had to go to rehab, or were you able to just quit? I never went to rehab, but I probably should have done. You know. Did you stop? I stopped completely. Yeah. I, 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 well, what, what played what, into that decision? Well, my life, my, I, I didn't lose all my money. I didn't lose any jobs. Um, uh, but I did, I, my life did start to fall apart. Uh, and uh, um, my life fell apart. There was all these children all over the place. There was absolute chaos. Uh, How many children? Four. Okay. Uh, uh, four children. Uh one child uh, I had two children with a wife and one of those children was in the middle of those two children and then that when she showed up that kid showed up like nine, well, the kid the kid's mother showed up nine years later with a lawsuit and mm -hmm. and uh, they people were, I mean I, you know I'm a side man I'm, <laughs> I'm not I'm not Eric Clapton and uh, not Tom Petty and I, uh, uh, not Duran Duran I'm a, I'm a very well paid side man, but I don't have the millions the millions that come with being a rock star. <laughs> right, it's basically like being a doctor or something. Exactly. And uh, you know, doctors can't go out and have children all over the place either. Right, right. right. So, uh, you know, as somebody whose father took off, how did that play into the way that you saw these children when they showed up? Well, this 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 was it. You know, when 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 I decided when when my when my wife got pregnant. She lived in France. Uh, 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 How many I, wives have there been? There's been four. Okay. There's, there's been four. So uh, you beat uh, you beat uh, you beat Phil Collins by one. I beat Phil Collins by one. You tied Ignacio Barroa though. I did. Yeah. Yeah, but I didn't meet uh, beat. Um, you know, he's got a lot. Is uh, um, uh, what's his name? Um, Chili Peppers. Chad. Chad. How many does he have? Fuck. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I've been waiting to talk to him. Yeah, he's, Chad, he's on the list. Chad's but. my hero for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you but know. is that actually true? I mean, that that fucks you up, right? You, you you fall in love and you get married and you think, okay. I mean, there, there's probably some part of you after the third wife where you're still like, okay, I, I'll try this again. Fourth well, time's a let's charm. Not, so, let's not let's not confuse love with a selfish. Uh, self-centered selfish person that just wants things to look right right and that's what you were dealing with and, and who were you on the inside let's put it this way um, I stopped I stopped uh, uh, doing this stuff on my own uh, in uh, April the April the 30th 1993 uh, three weeks later I was going mad and I stopped when I stopped on my I was just it, it, it got my life had got into such turmoil that I didn't think that there was any way out of that right uh, that it was it was it was such a mess with law courts and uh, and and children and hiding stuff from people and and like and hiding money from people no no hiding hiding the fact that I had a kid in between my two children with my oh, ex-wife okay hiding that and hiding uh, hi, uh you know, just, just 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 like maintaining that lie takes a lot of energy oh god and it was it was it was 
you know, it was it was just a mess. There was just no way out of it. Uh, you know, I had to go backwards and forwards to Cleveland. And to make things worse, I knocked up another girl. But I never looked at it as being knocking up another girl. This was like <laughs> another girl, got she got pregnant. This was my thinking. Oh, so you weren't taking responsibility for no, it? No, of course not. Of course not. Why would I take responsibility for that? I wouldn't have a baby if I was in that situation with me. Right. So what are they thinking? So that's what you call self-centered, selfish and self-centered. So was there a particular event that knocked you back to earth? Well, when I like what what knocked me back to earth was 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 when I when when I decided that ah, you know I I couldn't even get high anymore. It was it, 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 I used to be able to get high and just not think of anything. I couldn't put enough anything inside of me to 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 forget about to forget about what was going on. And uh and um and uh I just was at Nathan East house one day after a TV show and uh, and I had a bottle of vodka and an eight ball of cocaine and I said to him uh, he was cleaning his kitchen and I said to Nathan I said you know I don't even know why I've, I've been on this doing this for a bit now and I said I don't even know why why I'm doing it I said we're not even going to go out you know tonight I said I'm uh, I said I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to pack this in you know and Nathan came up, he said, that's great that's great listen swear, swear off and I'm like, slow down. I'm going to finish this first. <laughs> I still have, I can't let this perfectly good eight yeah, ball go to ex waste. Exactly. So that's what I did. I, 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 uh, I finished that, and I got up the next day, and I went back to New York. And a few days, a few days later, I started to go crazy. Started to have dreams uh, that I, when I'd wake up, and I couldn't tell if they were, if I, if where I was, or if I'd done what I thought I did, and uh, and uh, and. Um, I just went. I just went into this nightmare, nightmare place, and um, and so uh, uh, what happened was was that a, a, a good friend of mine, uh, Stephen Bruton, uh, I don't know if you know who he was. He he wrote the music, The Crazy Heart, and uh, he died of cancer a few years ago. And um, he uh, he was we, we used to we used to hang out and drink and use together when we played with Christine McVie. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and he must have been tight with T-Bone then too, right? Yes. Yeah, got it. But I was, uh, uh, he was, uh, we, we called ourselves the Steve Brothers. And uh, Steve, Steve uh, uh, called me up and asked me how I was doing and I was a mess. And, uh, and, uh, and I knew that he'd stopped drinking, but he never ever mentioned about, you know, going to any program or anything. And uh, he... Um, he, he he asked me if I wanted to go 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 and get some help uh, with, uh, uh, with AA, and my knee jerk reaction to that was, uh, oh, no, I don't want to go. I don't want. No, I'm not that bad. I don't want to go down there. And and he said, well, stay where you are, and uh, uh, I'll get back to you. And he jumped on a plane in Austin, Texas, and he flew to New York, and he took me took me to my first AA meeting. And uh, the only the only reason that I went to that was. Um, out of the goodness of my heart <laughs> because he'd come because he'd made the whole trip yeah, yeah. To try to take me to trying to help me <laughs> and uh, i walked into that meeting and i sat and i watched a guy talk and uh, and i felt better and that was the thing that kept me going back because I, before that i felt awful i was in a losing battle really and um it's been 24 years you still go every day it's the way i did the way i stay sober on the road the way um the way i uh, i maintain my sobriety it's the most important thing that I have. Uh, uh, you know, I got this, I got uh, all those children, all those children, 12, it took 12 years for that. Uh, I used to live in that house there. I used to own that house there. And uh, um, it took 12 years 
for all that mess that I had with the kids and the courts and everything to come together. I had all those two, all those problems were in that, in there with me, in that little bit there, there's my bedroom was there. They're all in there with me Christmas day, all the, every problem that I had. Now, if you'd asked me, if you'd asked me, uh, you know, when I first, when I first started going, if you just said, listen, all you got to do is do your best that you can with this and don't drink and don't use one day at a time, you know, and 12 years from now, all this stuff that you have going on now will be, will be over. I would have said, 12 years? Are you kidding me? You want me to do 12 years of this? But when you get there and, you, and, you, and, and, and you're sitting there and everything, everything's resolved, um, uh, you, uh, you, it, it, seems like, it seems like yesterday that it happened. You know? So now I'm another 12 years on from that. You know? I have eight grandchildren. Uh, 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 all my children love me. All my grandchildren love me. <laughs> you know. Um, uh, I also imagine that if you can learn to trust yourself, that everything is going to be okay, and that you're going to stick to it, that it must give you an enormous amount of confidence to pursue other things and to move forward with your life and to take that energy that you had been wasting by like maintaining this image and mm. keeping up all this lies and channel that into your art or something else yeah i mean i guess so i mean it's it's kind of hard to intellectualize the dang thing really you know it's a uh, uh you know i i can't say that i didn't have some good times and i can't and uh, uh back back in those days but where it ended up was miserable you know uh, it ended up with me just sitting there watching the tv i watch home shopping club and you know snort blow and drink vodka out of the bottle and uh, and feel sorry for myself, and uh, and uh, and uh, and and nothing nothing would get fixed, you know. And uh, 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 you know, I mean, by rights, uh, the way that I treated people, they 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 shouldn't forgive me at all. But they everybody's everybody's uh, uh, forgiven me for the stuff that I've done. You know, I mean, it's uh, 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 my children have forgiven me. I mean, one one daughter one daughter was it was so complicated with the, with this with this law case it was like any time that I said anything to this daughter that her mum would say something to the lawyers and the lawyers would just take and twist what I had to say and it would come back at me in court and they was like no that's not that's not what I said you know and uh, you know like like I said you know I've been hiding I've been hiding stuff and you said what do you mean hiding money no I didn't have money to hide right. that was the problem right everybody thought that I had money hidden. So it's like so there was a, there was all this stuff that went on and then uh, there was a, a a disregard for my children that that, that that now were living with me they were living with their mum at one point in France and then they came over here to live with me and I had them in I had to have them in boarding school because I couldn't look after them on my own and and go out on the road and leave leave two two teenagers hanging out in my house alone that wasn't going to happen you know? right so. Uh, my my children, uh, 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 my children's uh, well well being was it was in danger because, like I say, people were coming after me. Like I had millions, and it's like you know what I, I do well, and I'm paying what I can, but I don't have that kind of money, and, it, and trying to trying to convince them that, uh, where where I was with that. It was a, it was a horrible horrible time, but had I not done that, then uh, 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 you know I wouldn't be where I am now. It all worked out, and it seemed, it seemed like it was something that was totally impossible to work out ever, and it, and uh, and it and it did. Well, one of the first steps in AA is giving yourself over to a greater power than yourself. It's a, a, the third step. What is that for you? The first step is admitting you're the, the, it's, it's, it's admit that you're alcoholic you know, and, and, uh, and that your life is unmanageable, which is very easy to do for me. The second step uh, uh, came to believe that a power greater than yourself can restore you to sanity. So that was a problem because... Yeah, I, even though I was an order boy when I was a kid, somewhere between there and then, I didn't like God anymore. <laughs> as a matter of fact, I used to think of him as being a human being. I was going to kick his ass when I met him. <laughs> you know? And then you turn your will in your life over. So 
what happens what I believe happens the way that the way that my what, that I understand my higher powers is that he's constantly reaching out trying to take me to a path of goodness and all I got to do is to be willing to listen to do what I have to do you know and um, and um, and uh, uh, I got led different places and found different things and different people would say stuff and 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 I and I found uh, you know, with, with great difficulty in turn, turning to, to, to be able to turn my will and life over. Um, I, I, was, I was living in New Mexico and, uh, and, uh, with a girlfriend, and she, and she had a big property, and I decided that I was going to try and build a water feature. And on this property, there was a waterfall. And I decided to build this little koi pond with a with a with a with with a with a little fountain going in it, you know. So I had to dig the hole, get a liner, go on the property, find the rocks, and put all the rocks in, and bring it all back, and then make it look nice, and then put in the filter, and uh, put the pump up, and do all that, and put the make the rocks so that the water went down into the into the thing. And finally, I finished this little this little little very small koi pond. And I thought, well, I'll take a walk on the property. And I took a walk down to the property, and I get down to the property's waterfall. And there's this magnificent, it was just beautiful, it was running beautifully. You know? and, um, and I said, you know, as hard as that was for me to build that little thing, you know, the power of the universe takes care of this waterfall pretty good without too much difficulty at all. So I think I'll try and let it do what it's got to do. And uh, uh, the moment that I did that, all the problems that I had started to go away. That people would, you know, I said to my lawyers, you know, I said, you know, I, I, I'm going to try. I got a, I got somebody that's going to be helping you guys. And my law, New York lawyers, you know, women. <laughs> Who's this? I said, well, actually, you know, God's going to try and uh, help us out with this thing here. You know, I said, we're just going to do, we sign whatever we do. We're not going to commit to do anything that I can't do. I mean, we're just gonna we're just gonna sign the papers that we have, and we're gonna you know, we're gonna let let God take care of the whole thing. And they said, "Well, you know, it's very admirable, Steve, but things don't work that way." I said, "Well, things haven't been working that way with us doing stuff, so we're just gonna let it go." And uh, and it took a week before they called me up and they said, "You wouldn't believe what just happened," and the whole thing just sorted itself out. I found this booklet, a little booklet by a guy named Emmett Fox, called "The Golden Key." It says, if you have any problem at all, all you have to do is stop thinking about the problem. Drive any thought of the when you start to dwell on the problem. What can I do? I've got to do this. I've got to do that. So drive any thought of it out of your mind and, and stop thinking about the problem. Start thinking about God. And it allows, it allows the power of the universe to fix whatever there is going on in your life. And i got to tell you, I know it sounds kind of trite. And I know probably some people would be listening uh, to this podcast and saying, well, I got some real problems. And I, I understand I've had some real problems myself. But uh, uh, whenever I've done that, they've worked out. And it's usually worked out in a positive way. Sometimes it got a little worse before it got better, but it always got better. Well, you stopped drinking and using in 93. And then in 94 were the Wildflowers recording sessions, correct? Yeah. Well, actually, it, in 93, we started in October of 93, 92. Okay, and I started recording. Uh, uh, I started recording in '92, and then I came. Uh, well, I was still drinking when I first started working with Tom, and then I went back to New York, and then I got called to come out and finish the album. And when I came back out, um, I'd stopped drinking. And I think the album came out in '94 or '95. '95. The first tour was in '95. And at that point, when you started playing with him, you weren't necessarily a band member. I was going in to do. Uh, I was going in to do a solo album. Uh, Tom was doing a solo album. Right, right. It so it was just a that. session. Yes. And then it evolved into you becoming a full time band member. Yeah. And that's been your longest artistic relationship. That's correct. Yeah. Twenty four years. Um, Twenty five years in October. And it's been very well documented. I mean, the, the heartbreakers have. I, I watched the movie about it. Yeah. It's like six hours long or something. Yes. <laughs> um, so what do you think is missing from all that documentation? What, what can you say about the way that you interact with that group of guys that makes it so special for you? You know, it's funny. There's, there's a, there's a, uh, um, 
the, the heartbreakers really don't hang out that much together you know uh, but what we do have i think is uh when we get together to play music that's where we really click you know i mean it's not like i can't go over and see mike you know uh, not unheard of for me to call him up and go over and smoke a cigar with him every once in a while or take him over a cigar and go sit smoke with him or you know or go over and see tom you know it's not but it's very few and far between we don't hang out all the time with each other but we do when, when we get together uh, uh, and make music that's uh, that's really the, where the strength the strength of the heartbreakers is i believe is that something that you have to talk about very much or like is there a concept that you guys have honed over the years or has it just kind of happened it, organically it, it just happened organically just sort of fell in that way you know I, I, we we care about each other enormously you know um, um but uh, I, it, we don't sort of live out of each other's pockets a lot we don't we don't go out to dinner a lot you know uh, as you know some bands they usually a lot of them usually go out as a group to dinner uh, and this band doesn't do that most bands that I work with anyway, so I'm always going out, a bunch of us all go out to eat. Is it still a joy to play oh, yeah. after all these years? Oh, yeah. yeah. Every time? Every time. The difficult part about touring with the Heartbreakers is that after I have to tour with other people. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have to? Uh, well, you know, I like to play. Steve, thank you so much for being on See, the show. See, it wasn't about drums after all. It was about right. golden key. <laughs> it's about God. As a matter of fact, you know what? I got a golden key in there. I'm going to give you one. Trap Set is produced by me, Joe Wong, along with Chris Karwowski, who also edits the program. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Trap Set. And visit our website, thetrapset.net, to subscribe to our show for free. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please donate to our show. If you can't afford to donate, please tell a friend and give us a good rating on iTunes. Send your feedback and guest requests to thetrapset at gmail.com. <laughs>